So I'm so excited to have you here. We have an amazing guest joining us today. Holy moly, you are in for a treat. However, Cody is amazing. Hopefully you've already done your Google stalking on her. If not, I'm going to drop in the chat right here, a link where you can stalk Cody all you want, because here we're digging into the real stuff. We're digging into the good stuff. We're not doing like the 101, like, where are you from? How'd you get started? Me. That's what Wikipedia is for. That is what LinkedIn is for. We're not doing that here. So get that sort of one-on-one stalking out of the way before we start, because Cody is going to be digging in on all sorts of things about becoming financially free, about becoming a, a critical thinker when it comes to your finances and your work and your business. We're going to be diving into some pretty thick topics. I'm excited, which brings me to don't panic about taking notes. I always get these crazy messages of people be like, Cody mentioned a book. Like, which book was it? Don't worry. We've already solved that for you. So you can go to sendmenotes.com, sendmenotes.com, put in your email. You can relax, put up your feet. I'm not going to do that because that'd be weird, but you can put up your feet and maybe just sip on your tea. Don't worry about taking notes. We will take all the notes for you. They will hit your inbox on Tuesday. So you are so welcome. This is going to be an interactive conversation. If you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have comments, that's what your fingers are for. That's what that box is for. So you can type them all in there and Cody and I will tackle them as we get to it because we're all part of this conversation together. So I don't know where you are in the world. Well, I know where some of you are because you told me. Um, so hi to David and Anna and Jeff and Nicole and James and Luke and Devin and Cody. Oh my gosh, so many good people here today. And wherever you are, I'll please raise your glass and help me in welcoming Cody to our little coffee talk. Hello, what's going on, Kim? This is so fun. This oh, is so fun. Me. Yeah, please take a sip. Please caffeinate yourself and get ready. Um, okay, so hopefully everybody did some one-on-ones talking, but you know there are some people hiding in the back who didn't do their homework. So if they were to meet you at a party or they were to meet you in a coffee shop, what would be your like one-on-one, three, four sentence description of who you are and what you do? Yeah, short and sweet. I'm an investor. I buy and invest in boring businesses. I've done it in a bunch of different areas from Latin America to cannabis to beyond. And now I kind of obsess about two things, how to think critically and how to cash flow unconventionally. Okay. And define your interpretation of cash flow unconventionally, because I think that that's a very unique keyword and phrase. So what I mean by that is basically this, you know, um, I think we were all taught supposedly finance, math. We all did that calculus class that we never wanted to go to in high school and college. Right. But but we were never really taught the real things that lead to freedom. Oh, I've got a sidekick here today. You can see him walking behind. This is Babar. He doesn't drink coffee. Um, it, but what I realized is I was in finance for like, you know, I've been in finance since I graduated. So 13 years or something like that, 14 years. And um, I didn't have financial freedom freedom. I worked for somebody else. I had a salary for somebody else and I did, and I had to do the job. It wasn't always that I wanted to do the job. And so my mission became, how do I get people to where they are financially free and then they can choose to do the work that they were singularly put here to do. And so unconventional cash flowing to me means things like not just side hustles, but how can you stop trading your time for money and how can you get your money to work for you? And so that might be things like, we talk about some weird ideas on country and thinking my newsletter. It might be like how to rent land by natural parks out to campers and cash flow on it monthly, or how to invest in farmland in a fractionalized model and get mailbox money every month, or how to open your own little mailbox company like a UPS store and how to make 120K a year like my friend Lisa did. So we try to take those ideas and demystify them. You don't have to be the next Elon Musk to do it. Well, and what I love, the phrase that I love so much, because I feel like you use it a lot and it resonates with me and I've heard other people use it around as well, is trading your time for money. And I think when we all think about sort of even just basics, you know, what you learn, which is very little in terms of finances in high school or college is, you know, you hear a lot about like, well, your 401k, 
Well, like compounding interest, like, you know, we want you to put away money here so that it can compound, compound, compound and make money, you know, while you're getting older and then one day you can spend it. And that's kind of it. Like that's kind of where the education stops on your, your finances. And then the rest of the time you're right. You're, you're trading your time, which is working for somebody, you know, 9 p.m., 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. for for money. Was that something that you sort of always knew, okay, I'm not going to do that? Or were you like, okay, I really want to go work a corporate job. And then once you were there, you were kind of figuring out like, oh, this grass is not so green after all. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know any of this when I grew up. I mean, I, I'm the daughter of immigrants. Um, I, I think I called a 401k a 401k for a while because I, I didn't realize how to say it uh, properly. So I got, you know, I, I didn't know this stuff growing up. I had no idea what a mutual fund was or an exchange traded fund. And since then, I mean, I've done the investment banking route. I've worked a lot of the big firms. Now I, I know I'm always learning, but I know, but I think the the thing that I realized is we are taught to chase credentials instead of chasing cash flow. And I like to flip the script. Like I look back on if I had started early on, like one one example, if I was brand new in college today, what would I be doing? Well, I would either one, try to figure out a way to get my parents or to save up enough money to get a you know, small amount for a down payment to get a mortgage. Now, say you're not in a position to do that, I would do house hacking where I would rent out a property and I would sublease multiple rooms in the place so that I could essentially live for free and other people could pay me for it. And I would do the same thing if I had a mortgage. And I think about all the money I spent on rent so many years for other people and it was wasted. And why wouldn't I try to build an asset instead of that? Same thing with your car. It's like, why wouldn't you utilize your car that you have right now, put it on Turo, a ride sharing app and uh, cash flow on the assets or on the liabilities that you have, turning them into assets. So we start, we kind of have like five different levels. So we start from how do you make money in cash flow when you have zero dollars? And then went all the way up to when you have a million dollars plus, how do you really get your money to work for you? And that gets into more complex things like tax strategy and beyond. But here's the, the secret. I'm not like obsessed with being super rich or obsessed with money. I'm obsessed with freedom. And my thought is financial freedom allows for personal freedom, like you get to do what you want to do day to day, which allows for philosophical freedom, which means you get to think the thoughts you want to think without having to be worried about your personal freedom or your financial freedom being taken away. So money is like the Trojan horse we slip in for people to actually think differently and create the lives that they want. And I'm curious because I feel like most people who have had your experience, who have met the people that you've met, understand the concept that, that you understand, um, let, I mean, we're all friends here. Let's be honest. They keep it to themselves or, yeah. or maybe they share it with like a close group of friends and it's, you know, the traditional old boys club or, you know, old girls club, or I don't know, pick your gender. It's a club yeah. and there's old people and they're in it. So, I mean, what sparked you? Because by the way, you could have just gone about your merry way doing all these things that you just talked about and not, creating a newsletter and not creating courses and not creating content. So what was that spark that you're like, you know what? I have to share these things with people. I can't just keep it all to myself. Well, I think the part that I got lucky about was that I was a journalist first. So I covered like human trafficking and drug smuggling in Latin America before I ever went into finance. And the whole reason I went into finance, this is like, I graduated a year early from undergrad. I mean, it was Arizona State, so it was like more drinking than you know doctoral degrees, but like regardless. So I graduated a year early and I was uh, in Latin America doing my thesis for the honors college there um, on human trafficking and drug smuggling. I saw horrible things, you know, bodies hanging mutilated from, uh, you know, overpasses, uh, people killed in front of me. Like, um, at, you know, this was during the height of the, the Sonoran and Sinaloan cartel wars. And I remember at one point just thinking, gosh, my last name is Sanchez. These, a lot of these last people, people's last name is Sanchez too. How come I live this life and they live that life? And it wasn't just because I was American. It was because I have financial freedom. So I was like, God, it's not really enough for me to just cover this stuff. Like I want to change it. How do I think I can change it? Well, I bet the bigger the tool that you have for change, the more change you can make and money is just a tool. So that's why I went to go figure it out. And that's what led me, you know, I, I worked in finance kind of quietly, Kim, but you know, you and I know each other for a while and we're buds. Like I'm not that quiet. So like I had like four, you know, I tried to start like three or four other media companies before this, but in finance, they hate that. So they would like 
tell me to quit the business. Um, they would uh, tell me like things like you're going to move the market if you keep the company. You you know you can't keep doing this. And I had like four people and my mom on the newsletter. Like nobody cared. Um, and so you know I, I think at some point this is just like where I come from, and it makes sense to be here today. But I will say this: like there's a lot of people that say to me, and like the internet's a scary place at times on Twitter where I'm pretty public. Like you know they'll be like, ah, she's just out there trying to get more newsletter subscribers. It's like the newsletter's free, bud. Or like, oh, she sells courses. She just wants to make her. I'm like, no, I don't make anywhere near the amount of money I make in all my investments in this business. It's just, what do you want to have on your tombstone? I made a lot of zeros, like arbitrary things that I can't touch and take with me, or like I made some sort of impact or legacy. So ultimately it's selfish, but I was like, I think I can do some cool stuff. I love creating content. I'm a journalist by trade. So I got it out there, but don't get me wrong. It's actually scary for, you know, this, like, it's scary when you go out and start creating stuff. How many people are like, did you see what you look like in that most recent video? Like, you know, do you, do you, I mean, I, we just created this little content piece. It'll go out like this week. And it's like all the hater comments we get. And it's like, it's, it's so gnarly. So I get why people don't do it, but it is the single most fun thing that I've ever done. And I actually think it'll have the highest ROI long-term with like humans met like you opportunities and deal flow. Well, and I also think, you know, I, I think an analogy that everybody can realize is if you have ever done something hard in your life, maybe you signed up for a marathon, um, maybe you signed up for some sort of contest or whatever, and you work really hard at that goal and eventually you finish it, like you finish that marathon or you did that thing, your sense of purpose and elation is so great. So I almost feel like you and I, sadly, we keep signing up for the marathons. <laughs> We keep signing up for like, yeah, we should start a newsletter. Yeah, we should do this because you do get, it's the one email that you do get among the 75 hateful comments that's like, you changed my life. Or yeah. now I have a second income stream and I'm able to take three more family vacations with my ailing father. Like that's the type, like it takes one of those messages for you to be like, okay, it was a marathon, but like it was worth it. Dude, it's so true. And just two cents on that. It's like, we keep a running list of all the people who have started businesses, become financially free, whatever. And so I think at this point, there's been like 65 people have uh, taken their, their normal active income and replaced it entirely with passive. We've had uh, like 13 or 14 people start their own newsletter business that is now profitable. Um, we've had, uh, Nikki, my my COO would know this, we've had like a hundred and something side hustles started from this. So like we kind of keep track of the list. And so at some point, you know, you create a little army of humans who can't be controlled by other people because they are financially free. Could you imagine what our world would look like right now if we were act acting not from fear and scarcity, but from abundance? Like it will look pretty different. And I would be down for that. Well, sign me up. I'll be the first one on your, your Noah's Ark, Cody's Ark of financial freedom off into, off into the sea. I'm there. Okay. I love this question from Jeff because it sort of touches on the point you made earlier. If you could do college over again, what would you do? If you were today launching a business, a course, a something, and you didn't have any following and you, you know, didn't have anybody that was already subscribed to what it was you were doing, where would you start? Yeah. Well, when I started, I didn't have anybody, Jeff, and I love this pop-up situation. You're so much more tech savvy than I am, Kim. Um, so uh, I didn't have an audience. And so um, I really like to, um, well, they call it in PR and you would probably know this, it's draft off the cultural conversation, right? So. Um, in this instance, what I like to do or what I did in the beginning is I went to a bunch of Facebook groups that had big followings that were my target market, right? And inside those groups, those were groups like Trends, The Hustle, Business Insider, Morning Brew, and they all have Facebook groups with thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people in them. And I would add a lot of value up front. I would share specific case studies, stories, snippets, ideas people could take and do. And then I would say, if you wanna hear more, I could like drop in the comment like a newsletter that I wrote on it, right? And then I would drop in the comments once they'd already approved the overall post. Hey, by the way, I wrote this cool thing on it. It's free. You want to check it out. And so I must have done that ad nauseum. Nobody was listening to me for a while until finally we we started getting people to grow. And when you get into those communities. How long did that take you? 
So, so we did a whole post. Um, if you go to contrarianthinking.co and you search um, first ten thousand dollar first ten thousand subscribers, I did day by day exactly what we did every single day, and you can see some of the pain inherent in it to get to the first ten k. So we we hit ten k in thirty days. Uh, and we is funny. That's like a royal we. It's like me and Babar, the dog, that's sitting over here doing nothing because I didn't have anybody else at the time. And I had a full nine to five. I'm always a partner in a private equity fund. Um, but on the side, I, you know, my husband was watching Netflix and be like, what's wrong with you? And I was like posting in Facebook groups. I don't know. Um, so anyway, I think you can do it pretty quickly. The keys are this. You have to really serve. So 10x serve for every 1x ask. And the service has to be um, tactical, meaning you can like touch it, feel it, do it, actionable in the moment and applicable to a lot of people. Um, and if you have those specific things, then people will gravitate towards it. What also helps is if you talk to real people like what Kim and I are doing right now and you say like, I don't know, whatever you're like, Jeff, if you post in here, we could do, do it later. But like whatever you want to do your newsletter on, if it's about, um, something that would not be Jeff, but I'm just like gardening. I'm looking at some roses here. It might be like how Kim killed all of her new plants in her new house. Uh, and then with I this did. like one simple trick, saved all the plants and then sold her first propagated plants for $500. Like you want to like make it like very specific to a human. And then that stuff goes more viral as opposed to just saying, here's why I'm so smart. And here's my ideas on something. Well, and I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, when I'm hearing things like, you know, add 10x value and stuff like that, at least for my experience, you have to commit for maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's four weeks, maybe it's eight weeks to like, kind of have no life. Like, because you can, I guess I am a firm believer that you can't have it all right. Yeah. Like the whole goop Gwyneth Paltrow, we're going to meditate for an hour. We're going to work out for an hour. We're going to puree all of our baby food, cook all of the meals, organic, grow our own vegetables. Oh, by the way, and run a multi-million dollar business. Um, and like, no, like you have to pick and choose like for this season, maybe I don't get to work out as much. Or for this season, maybe I'm not getting nine hours of sleep. Maybe I'm getting seven hours of sleep because I need those two hours in the morning to accomplish this goal. So I think I would love for you to speak a little bit when you're talking about building something, creating a second revenue stream or third or fourth or fifth revenue stream, how you kind of look at time, because I think sometimes we are fed this grand myth that you can do it all, be it all, and still have time for like a blowout at dry bar. Yeah, it's true. And well, my cannot. nails aren't done. So, you know, yeah, you I'm, a, I'm a perfect example of that. Um, for, well, I would try one reframe book uh, first. If you haven't read Who Not How, it is a must because oftentimes you're absolutely right. If it is just the Cody show, I can't really do much, actually. I am very constrained and I have to either get really lucky or be exceptional at something. However, if I start to think about it as a who problem instead of a how problem, the whole thing changes. So for instance, if I was Gwyneth Paltrow, she has resources, right? So she can uh, she can hire somebody to puree the baby thing. She can hire somebody to run the other business and this and this and this, right? And so I think what you have to think about is you have two you have two tools here, right? Well, maybe three. You have time, you have money, and you have efficacy or efficiency. And so in this instance, you know, when I was first starting, I have more I had more money than I had time. So. Um, you know, I would do things like have a cleaning person come to my house and like not do that. And it was really hard for my husband. He's military. And so he, he came from do everything yourself, never spend anything on money. And when we first got together, I was like, okay, I could do that. Like typical girl in a new relationship. I'm like, I'm going to go work this like 60 hour a week job. I'm going to do the side hustles. I'm going to invest all the stuff. Can I make you dinner? You know, can I clean the house at the same time? No chance. So I just had to pick. I said, household stuff, I'm not going to do. If it is less than $100 an hour work, I'm going to outsource it. And then that $100 an hour work started getting higher. Then it was like 200, 300, 400, 500. Anything that's underneath that, somebody else is going to do it unless I like it or it adds a lot, a lot of value. And so I would start asking who could solve these problems for me. And then the other thing you mentioned, if you don't have money, but you have more time, uh, which is usually how that works, um, then I think you're right. You have to pick. In my situation, I would never cut working out. 
ever in a million years. Never cut your health uh, and never cut um, you know, your physical body because I think strong body, strong mind. So I would get up earlier. I would, I would eat healthier. I would cut a bunch of the entertainment activities that I want to do. I would do less drinking. I would go out with friends less for sure. Um, but when you like what you're doing, none of that really feels as hard. Like Kim and I know like all the time, like, you know, somebody will say, do you want to come out and do this? And, you know, I'm like, not really, I'm going to go right tonight, you know, cause I like it. So find that thing that you love to do. And then like missing a, a boy's night out, is not that big of a deal. Well, and again, it, hopefully you also have friends that are pursuing their own passions and then hopefully get it. And if you don't find those friends, mm -hmm. you can maybe find them today because though that's going to be really super valuable. Okay. Here's another question. When you think about splitting your time, not you as Cody, but, but a yeah. person, um, mm -hmm. if you were giving advice to somebody else about how to split time between, you know, their regular corporate job, and maybe they have an idea about a side hustle or think that they might have time to start one. How would you tell them to think about that? Yeah. Well, first, I mean, the, the OG one on this, right, is Tim Ferriss four hour work week. Like he's the one who basically uh, gave us the guide map. So I will try not to recreate anything that he says. And I would just say, if this is an issue for you at this moment, read that book. You have two homework assignments or just listen to it on audiobook. Uh, Tim Ferriss, Four Hour Work Week, and Who Not How. With those tools in your toolkit, you should be able to solve this question. This question, in my opinion, um, to me, is a great first question. It should never stop you. This is a low level question. And I don't mean that to be rude. I just mean it's low level on the steps of the next things that you need to get to that are going to get in your way. This is figure outable. So if you are in a situation where this is stopping you from what you're going to do next, for 99.9% .9 of people, this shouldn't be an issue. Now, of course, there are always exceptions. Like my mom and dad had to work multiple jobs. He worked at a slaughterhouse nonstop. He like, so yes, I understand that. But for most of us in this country, in the US, if that's where you are, we that's probably not, uh, shouldn't stop us. Now, what I will say is um, when you're doing your side hustle, you have to, uh, especially if you're doing something like I do, which was creative, um, I had to reserve it for times where my brain wasn't fried. So like Tom, Mark Twain said, eat, you know, if you're going to eat a frog, eat it in the morning. And if you're going to eat two, eat the big one first. And so that meant get up early, get a hard workout in, in the morning and immediately do the side hustle before the nine to five and then go do the nine to five but try to be more efficient and squish your nine to five into a nine to three, for instance, and then take your three to six or three to seven and do the low level work that is necessary for a side hustle, like admin, setting up a website, you know, adding new systems or whatever, and your creative, really important stuff in the morning. The only caveat for that is if you're uh, the type of person that's really, really slow in the morning, you work better at night, then maybe you could flip it, but I still believe in eating frogs in the morning. I, I'm a morning person, so I 100% agree with you on that. I'm curious for you, you know, when we think about side hustles or people are asking about side hustles, I feel like what immediately comes to mind are maybe some more glamorous side hustles, or maybe it's something a little more traditional, like an Etsy store. But I feel like your kind of creative niche, you mentioned it earlier, are these boring businesses. So can you give a couple examples of like what these boring businesses are and why you think people are maybe not paying attention to them or just kind of like not seeing them for the opportunities that they are? Yeah, I think we had a total lie told to us, which was, um, you know, pursue your passion for your profits, right? And I actually think that that's pretty much BS. And the reason why is we should divorce early on, at least, um, profits from what we want to do. If all our goal is for our side hustle is money, now let's focus how to get money in the door. And let's focus on how we can, if we like writing, write really great copy about uh, a business that sells coffee mugs, right? Instead of saying like, I love coffee mugs. And so I must find a way in the world to create this thing. Um, and so, you know, when I look at side hustles, what I kind of talk to people about is I almost think about it like an investment strategy. You know, you have your portfolio and Robinhood or Vanguard or whatever, and you see all of these different 
allocations you can have, like bonds, fixed income, emerging markets, da, da, da. I think about side hustles like that. And when you put together a portfolio, and Fernando knows all about this, your man, um, you're always thinking about what is the highest return on my dollar with the lowest risk on my dollar, right? It's called risk adjusted return. And I like to think about side hustles like that. So I, when you go to do a side hustle startup, what do you do? It's actually totally counterintuitive. You spend money with the hope that you're going to make it, right? You're like, I'm going to put a bunch of money to buy stuff in an Etsy store, and I hope to God somebody buys this stuff. What I like to do is say, why don't you look at businesses that already exist and think about buying them? They have cash flow day one. You use somebody else's money to buy the business. We could talk about that. That's things like SBA loans. Um, that's things like seller financing. And then I take a business that is profitable day one. I don't have to have millions of dollars. We can talk about how. And I can then build that into something that's bigger. Um, so that's what I like to think about. Or worse comes to worse, if you do want to start your own business, before you spend any money, sell first and then see if you have a business second. And that's how I like to think about the two. Well, and anything I think that you can do where you're getting cash flow from day one, because you're right. I think so many people think about whether it's Etsy stores or I'm going to start a peanut butter business or cupcakes or whatever. And it's like, there could be months, months of just you spending money and nothing because yeah. you're getting product or you're getting space or you're getting real estate. And that I will say mentally from friends I know who have gone through it as, as I'm sure you do as well as founders mentally, that is exhausting. It's exhausting on yourself. It's exhausting on the people around you. Like that is 100%. a very, very draining process. Yeah. Just I totally, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. I think you have to be really careful about where you put, um, about where you put your time and effort into any business that you're doing or any startup. And you've got to preserve it relentlessly. And so um, that is something that I would focus on 10X is where are you actually spending your time and why and what's the return you're gonna get on it. So I think you nailed that. I feel like you are the type of person that is constantly looking into new things, new categories, new businesses. You have that sort of like business curiosity factor that I can, can, maybe you can teach it, but it's really difficult. I feel like it's just one of those things like you're a curious person or you're not. And so for you, what has been some rabbit holes lately that you've gone down that you're like, I don't know, NFTs or is there a rabbit hole that you've gone down lately? That you're like, this has been really interesting for me. Um, yeah, a lot. I mean, actually, I don't find, I think the NFT thing is interesting. I do not totally understand it still. And I think, um, you know, which I get a ton of hate on Twitter for this, but I'm like, you know, I have an Airbnb and I talk about that. We have a couple of Airbnbs and it makes X thousands of dollars a month in profit. And I compared that to my friend, Tom, who basically built a company that was like 1.3. I'm sorry. He, he bought a rock, a fake JPEG rock NFT. And then, and he bought it for $50,000, which in and of itself seems crazy to me. And then he sold it for $1.3 million. This is like a true story. It was all over CNBC and Bloomberg, et cetera. So, um, no. a, yes. And so, so I think it's interesting, but I a thousand percent, uh, do not think that that's the way that you should go. I don't know what you feel about that same asset class. I I have tried to listen to like numerous podcasts about it. I've tried reading about it. I just, I can't quite, I get it. I in theory get it. You have this piece of art, only you can own it. It is trackable. It's like if I sold a Picasso, it's like a digital system of knowing who that Picasso is going to. So like conceptually, I get it. I don't understand how it will be used in practice. So, I mean, and maybe again, that's when we're all wearing headsets all the time and we're living in like this virtual world where, what was that movie? I read the book and now of course I'm forgetting the name of the book, but the kid basically lives in a virtual world and, and it's like a dystopian universe. Like he lives in a trailer park and everything is gone. Like the environment has gone to crap and he wears the headset all the time. Oh yeah. I, um, Ready Player One. It's a one. book. 
Ready player one. Okay. If yes. we moved into like ready player one zone, then I get it because your little virtual room and your thing has your NFTs. I get it. But like, I just don't feel like we're living in ready one player world yet. And quite honestly, after 18 months of being cooped up with this freaking virus, I am so oh, sick of the screens and I'm so sick. Like if you told me go into ready player one, I'd be like, no more screens. Give me some nature. I'm going to go hug a tree somewhere. I just, I can't, I can't wrap my head around it. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Um, it is, you know, I, I think the the other thing is there's so much to be made in sweaty businesses. There is so much that, um, you know, you can do in the real world. You know, I was kind of looking at some of these comments, which are fun to see and like going back and forth between them. So thanks for guys for putting all this stuff in here. Like, I, I think most people think that they have to be Elon Musk. They have to understand NFTs. They have to, um, you know, engage in these sort of um you know, 21st century technology in order to become a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. um, and you do not have to do that. And so uh, I think that's the, that's the truth is that you can build boring businesses in a really incredible way. Well, and it's like you said, it, it's, it's laundry mats. It's my favorite one that you posted about in your newsletter, which I subscribe, everyone should subscribe. So shameless plug, for Cody's newsletter, everyone should go. But one of the ones that I love that you had posted about, this was many, many months ago, um, but it was about how you bought land in Joshua Tree oh, and yeah. you were renting it out to people who wanted to camp on it. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. You just literally found this opportunity, bought it, it's not like you went and visited. It's not like buying, buying a house you're going to live in where, where you're like, what does the inspector say? I mean, people are literally camping on this land. And so that to me is the definition of not, it doesn't have to be these 21st century or like futuristic ideas. Yeah. I mean, so this one was fascinating. It was this guy, lady by the name of Kate. Um, and basically she uh, ran a bunch of businesses and, um, was camping next to a national park and found a site um it's called hip camp where you can actually rent camping sites right next to like grand canyon or whatever in this instance it was a net and joshua tree and she basically was able to go out to joshua tree and camp for like 50 dollars a night throw up her own tent and she saw this and was like wait a second i wonder how much land costs there and could i do this model and so she went out and i was amazed i looked it up there's a whole piece on country and thinking about this where you can go and you can go to zillow and search by land by national parks and buy pieces of land when i was first doing this land was like 15 to 20k who knows in this crazy world they had probably like three billion dollars because of inflation but um and so she bought land for like i don't know she bought like 20 acres or something like that for like ten thousand dollars an acre really cheap and then she started putting camping sites on there you have to have the right zoning there are particulars to this that are outlined in the post then she eventually did airstreams in it but um she uh basically um was able to rent this this land out she paid 10 to 15 K for it and rents it out for about $1,500 a month profit because you can put on average 10 campsites onto one acre. And so she had multiple acres. And so I love this idea of like, how could you take a typical thing like real estate and do it cheaper and easier? And that was the idea. I, you can't do that in Austin, Texas. Right. Just heads up. It's no, a, you it cannot do that in Austin, Texas. It's a and million it's dollars. <laughs> Land is a bajillion dollars, people. So don't don't worry. That's not <laughs> happening here. No, but in other no. places, yes. No, maybe I mean, like you know, and even like the other thing that you could do is you could sublease land. So you could go to somebody else who has who's a farmer, let's say, or has a bunch of agriculture near, uh, I don't know, Moab in Utah, and you could say, have you ever thought about adding camping sites onto your farmland where you already have cows grazing? And you don't even have to buy the property. You could just think about it. So the, the one thing I would say is most people think about why things don't, why things won't work. And instead they should be thinking, how could this work? And that's the real difference. And so um, if you can come up with creativity and see these ideas and start thinking, okay, I don't have $10,000. Okay. It's too expensive in Austin. Okay. You know, I don't have access to loans. So then think about how else could you do this in some way? Could you manage somebody else's hip camp property, whatever the case may be, but that's what I want to get people. Um, that's what I want to get people thinking about. 
I'm curious for you, I think you just hit on such a strong point, at least for me, which is your mind immediately going to sell how something can't work. I think if anyone else is like me, you sometimes have like a little devil on your shoulder in your brain that's like, yeah. you can't do something, you suck, your hair looks like crap or, you know, whatever. We're very mean to ourselves, um, but like the self-talk. And so I have to actively really reframe exactly what you said. How could this work? How can this be better? How can I improve as opposed to the just like, you suck, you can't do it, it won't work type of thing. Do you, are there, is there anything that you either listen to or do, whether it's maybe it's a podcast or something that helps keep you in kind of on the light side, on the angel side of, you know, you, you can do something and how to think about it as opposed to just maybe the default for a lot of us, which is doubt, fear, anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely have that too. I think it's typically like I'm scared of everything and I do it anyway. Um, and so, you know, that might be like some stuff. I mean, we were talking about this today. I was like, I'm going to Muay Thai this afternoon. You're like, oh, I'm going to go get a massage, you know? <laughs> and um, I know you do big, scary things all the time too. And so I don't really like going to Muay Thai all the time. It is a class. I'm new in Austin. So it's like a new class. I'm the only girl in the whole class. Everybody's like all tatted up and scary looking. They like want to punch each other. You know, I'm in there in my little matching outfit. You know, I'm like exhausted after 20 seconds, but I keep going. And I go because when I do those scary things, at least for me, maybe it's not scary for any of them. Um, then I realize, like, oh, you know what, I can kind of get punched in the gut a few times by a guy and I'm still alive and I'm fine. And so I think if we all did a little bit more of that, a, you know, a few harder, scarier things, whatever that may be for you, then everything else starts getting easier. And then I will say you want to build momentum. So you want little tiny wins, right? So you know, I wouldn't start with like, oh, I'm going to go launch a fund family and, and raise millions of dollars. But I might start with like, um, I'm going to go ask my parents or I'm going to go ask some buddies of mine if we could all put together a thousand dollars and let's invest in this fractionalized thing with a hundred bucks each. Or, you know, so you take these small wins and you're like, oh, I did that. I learned that worked out. Okay. Now a little bit more risk, now a little bit more risk. And you stair step up until you're at a place where you're taking risk that creates generational wealth. And, you know, this goes, it's the same idea with the, you know, $100 hour work. You start with, I'm going to outsource anything that's over $5 an hour. And then you go to 20 and then you go to 50 and then you go to hundred. And what people miss, and I miss too, is all you see with people like you or I is maybe we're at the $500 hour, a thousand dollar hour level. Um, but we didn't start there, you know, and I constantly have to remind myself of that. Not only that, but I think you made a great point, especially when talking about Muay Thai and doing the scary things that you have to put yourselves in rooms where you suck. Like I always say, my goal is to be the dumbest person in the room. If I'm the smartest yeah. person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I want to yeah. be the one asking all the questions. I want to be the person in the corner who is capital C confused <laughs> because that means that I am in a room with people who are smart, talented, and brilliant. And two things can happen. One, osmosis, you know, their smarts kind of start rubbing off on me. And yep. two, they challenge me to think bigger. I think that's yep. a lot of things that when you are hanging out or surrounding yourself at work or in your personal life with people that are maybe at your same sort of level or even below, you get really complacent. And you yep. get very much like, well, what I'm doing is fine. You know, very like pat on the back as opposed to you get in these bigger rooms and you think to yourself, oh man, there's three more things that I could be doing that I didn't even think about. And so I think that that's sometimes uncomfortable for people because people like being the big fish in the small pond. There's sort of a, yep. a comfort and, and a stature with that. Um, yep. And it can be very uncomfortable to be the small fish and continue to be the small fish and to opt to be the small fish. I mean... That to me is, is the definition of putting yourself out there. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, the, the um, I think first of all, uh, I'm a true believer that everybody has something to teach me. And I don't mean that in like, a t you know, I'm not very touchy feely. I'm not that nice. Like, I don't mean that in a pat yourself on the back sort of way. What I mean is like, no matter who from like, you know, I don't have kids from any mom anywhere. I could learn a billion things. Same from any dad. You know, I am new to Austin. I could learn something from anybody who's been in Austin or who is in Austin. Right. So like everybody has somebody, something that they can teach somebody else, no matter what level you're at from the president 
commitment down to me, you know? And so um, I would say, first of all, like give yourself that pat on the back. And then I, the other thing I would say is like, I remind myself all the time that if I'm the dumbest person in the room, I'm actually the smartest because I got into that room and I get to listen to them. The biggest mistake I think people make is um, they talk a lot. I notice this a lot with um, people who are who are maybe the newest in the room um, or who aren't totally comfortable with where they're at. They will be like, oh, I know this and I know this and I know this. And the, the, the OG secret move is just to ask a lot of questions. The, the move is just to say like, okay, tell me about this. What do you do? How did you get there? What happened? That's interesting. What's the most important thing you learned? What's the craziest thing you got out of that? And anybody can sound incredibly inten uh, intelligent from just asking questions. And so that's what I, I would do if, if I was listening is just go to every room where you're the dumbest and ask them on a bunch of questions. Plus we humans are super egocentric. We love to hear ourselves think and, you know, throw in a few compliments and like game over, you know? A hundred percent. And I would say, even if you, you know, Rafat asked this question about having no experience, I would say the, those are the types of situations where whether it is an expert or somebody in the workplace that is maybe more senior than you, you know, you should kind of saddle up next to them. Like I am such a strong believer in mentorship, in shadowing, apprenticeship, that sort of thing. You know, you don't have to necessarily be Cody. You can learn from Cody while Cody is out doing all of these things. And so I think sometimes we lose that. For you, Cody, is there someone that you, maybe you subscribe to their newsletter or their podcast or something that you kind of feel like you're learning from a lot? Oh God, everybody. But let me give a caveat first. I just did a, I just did a search from admin for an admin, right? For an executive yes. assistant for me. And then for somebody else who's more like project and operations oriented. And we just hired two people that we had hundreds and hundreds of applicants and um, we narrowed them down to maybe like 10 and interviewed those 10. And then we got them down to two How we might hire like two more for a couple of the roles. You know what? One of my biggest red flags was, is that people asked me, how much mentorship will come with this job? They asked me how much, um, how much of this is learning versus doing. And let me tell you why I think that's a red flag, because you are going to learn so much by 10 X serving before you one X ask. If you are the type of person that leads with your asks, as opposed to your offerings, we're not going to get along well. And I think you are going to struggle in your long-term progression. Because when you meet with people that are more successful than you and whatever the thing is, they're not more successful humans. They just might have one area down that you don't. Maybe one of those is me. I don't have time. I'm hiring people for roles because I have needs. I'm not hiring people because I have a dearth of mentees <laughs> that need, like, I just, I would love to add 50 more fucking Zoom calls to my, sorry, to my calendar. You know, it's not the case. And no successful person is like that. So my, my tough love is always like, you know, if you asked my team, I think, and I think some of them are on here, they could probably tell you, like, you know, I, I do personal reviews with them on their finances. I help them with lots of different things, but they're never entitled and they never expect. And the reason that I'm hard on that is because I was that same way. One of my like favorite mentors, um, he would never even know. I would never call him my mentor because he would be like, oh God, it comes with a lot of responsibility. Like look up the definition of the word mentor. It's, it's a big role. Um, and if I don't know you, Lord, I'm going to be really careful giving you personalized advice because I don't really know you. And what if I give you bad advice? That'd be terrible. So, um, so I, I think I would say, you know, instead, like David Osborne, for instance, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He's built up a couple businesses. But at the same time, while those are really interested in me, he's in great shape. He has an amazing marriage. He's great with his kids. He lives an incredible life. He has a ton of freedom. Those interest me in tandem with the money. And so when I first started talking to David, it was all help, 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 help. It was like, David, I saw that you just launched a book. Like I just retweeted it and posted it here. Like David, actually, like I wrote a review about it here. Oh, hey, would you want to be on a podcast? Like here's some other people that you could like maybe be on a podcast with. And like, let me make that introduction if that's interesting for you. Um, you know, it was like, oh, you're raising this fund. You know, maybe there's some people I know that would like want to invest in it. And he, I never asked him for anything. But believe you me. Did I get more information from him? Yeah, he invited me to stuff. You know, he sent me stuff when I asked very specific, particular questions like, oh, you know, um, you just launched a book. Did you frame out the book beforehand with an outline or did you have a ghostwriter? It's like, yes, no answers. Very, very, again, it's stair-stepping. Little asks, bigger asks, bigger asks, bigger asks, only after you've given a ton. 
And I would also say that those beginning asks should either be yes or no questions or resource-based. I just did a whole post about this yesterday, but when people ask for time, it's exactly what you said. It's like, I have no time. Yeah. <laughs> I need time. Is there a time store? And where do I buy stuff? Yeah. <laughs> because like, <laughs> I need more of it. Here's my money. Like, <laughs> please give me back. Um, I always love that Harry Potter movie where Hermione has like the time necklace. I'm like, where do I get one of those? Like, I oh need... yeah. Don't yes. ask for time. No, Never I agree. And and no, I found no, no. like Vendika said, like, wouldn't that show that the person is interested in personal growth? Yes, but on my dime. And so what I don't like about that, Vendika, is like, it is only your responsibility to get better. It's not my responsibility to help you get better. Now, do I spend most of my career trying to help people get better? Yeah, 100%. But it's not my responsibility because at the end of the day, I can't teach desire and I cannot move your hands for you and move your mouth for you and take action for you. It's only on you. And I don't mean you, Sandika. I mean like the, the, the global the you. you. And so, um, so when somebody asks me how much mentorship comes with this, that tells me that they're actually lazy because what that's saying is how much mentorship are you gonna give me? As opposed to instead saying, like, if I'm in the ecosystem, I'm gonna figure out a way to get some, you know? I'm gonna find solutions to it. I'm a solutions-oriented person as opposed to I need to be fed it. And, and let me tell you this, I don't think I'm alone in this idea. So if you go and ask a bunch of other business people and like particularly those who are public in any way, uh, and you were to apply for an admin role and then say, how much mentorship does it come with? I could almost guarantee you, you're rarely going to get that job. Um, and th most people won't tell you that because it's not that PC, but I'm more interested in you succeeding than being PC. Um, so that's my, that's my rant on that. <laughs> and, and because I did it a thousand times, can I pick your brain for coffee? I died when I saw Kim's uh, thing. I did that. Can I pick your bra coffee? Can I just have a few moments? Can I have time? Like, it's so, first of all, the visual is weird. And second of all, um, yeah, it's just, it's not, it's lazy. It was super lazy on my part. And I should have been more specific and helpful. Uh, chef's kiss. Chef's kiss to that. Okay. This is my favorite, favorite, favorite part of our whole discussion, which are like the rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. What is the best thing that you have started using lately or doing lately that you absolutely love? Like you're obsessed with it. Could be your Apple watch, could be your Muay Thai class, could be a book. You're obsessed with it. Uh, honestly, this is such a nerd response, but I am obsessed with productivity tools lately. So I'm going to give you three. The first <laughs> one is Slack, uh, which is kind of like everybody uses it, but uh, I basically mandated no emails, all Slack for my businesses. It's been a game changer. Um, so we, we pretty much, nobody's emailing anything. There's like no back and forth. It's all on Slack. Um, second is Notion. Notion is a, a content tool for, um, you know, creatives. When you have a bunch of content that you want to use, it's a game changer. I use it all the time. So that's Notion. Uh, and then the third one, this is, again, I'm so behind on this, Kim, but I like kind of made fun of Calendly for a while. So I'm wrong all the time. And then I had a situation where my, my assistant's family, she had to leave, she had a family emergency and I was trying to schedule all these meetings. It was a total mess. So I started using Cal Calendly and I was like, oh my God, this is the easiest thing ever. I can't believe I didn't use it sooner. So those three things saved me tens of hours a week. I love, okay, I still don't understand Notion. Offline, you're gonna have to give me a tutorial because I don't understand what all the hype's about and, but people but people rave about it. So obviously yeah. there's something going on there. I'll show you. Okay, that's totally fine. Okay, what what's the best gift that you've given yourself in the last 12 months that you felt like was really powerful and meaningful? <laughs> I had one funny one that I thought of today. It's like really, really cheap. One is yes. this. this is so ridiculous, but this little straw cup, because hydration is so important. I didn't realize how often it made me tired. This is like a plastic straw cup and it makes me drink uh, at least the two liters of water. I need to drink a day that I typically don't because I'm at my desk all the time. So this is kind of crazy, but, and I bought it at home goods for like five 99. So I was like, yes. Um, so, 
<laughs> so uh, I think having a cup on your desk with a straw, if we're talking about being more efficient and getting stuff done, uh, you can just increase the intake that you can take so much more. So that's a super silly, easy, cheap one. Um, and then the, the other one I think that's probably the biggest is just I have, I it's the who again, I hired a bunch of people to be operators in a ton of my businesses. And um, some of them are really inexpensive. So like, you know, I hired somebody to be a property manager, they just take a percentage of the property. I hired somebody like my cleaning lady to take care of some of the admin tasks, like returning boxes and other stuff. And so, um, you know, again, it's not available for everybody, but if you can outsource more, man, it's changed the game for the higher ROI activities that I can actually do. Ooh, I like that one. That's a good one. I got to copy that homework. What is the next thing that you're hoping to learn? Like you want to learn French or you want to learn to wake surf? Like, is there something that you, you've kind of had on the bucket list of like, yeah, I want to learn that, you know, sometime this year or next year? My, I mean, I have two. One is Muay Thai. I want to get really good at it. Uh, so that's a plan. I want to be able to be strong of mind and strong of body. Um, and, and I think the other one besides that is, um, and I'm not sure this is learning exactly, but we've talked about this before. I have this book that I've been writing for 472 years. Like writing is like, I thought about writing yesterday. I didn't write, but I thought really hard about it for at least five minutes. And so that's the other skill is like how to actually execute on the big project that I really want to do, which would be writing. We need to just set ourselves out in like a little mountain camp and just Henry Thoreau out in the woods. Yeah. I, I, I would know, I find think, something else to do half the time. Matthew, Matthew McConaughey did that, by the way. It's how you wrote Green Lights. Oh, and it's such a good book. It's such a good book. The audio is so good. I recommend it's, it like a crazy person. I know. And it's weird because I've never recommended a celebrity autobiography, but that one's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So good. Okay. okay. I have this theory where the old saying used to be like, you are the summation of the five people you spend the most time with. And I think that that's old school. And I think now with these crazy things, the new school is you are the summation of the five digital humans or brands or whatever that you spend time with. So I'm curious for you, what, accounts or humans or brands do you follow that you just feel like they light you up? Like they add to yeah. your life, you see their stuff and you're just like warm fuzzies. Um, I, uh, I think Twitter is probably the place where I get the most out of it currently. I follow a ton of people in the SMB space, space the small and medium business space. So I follow like, um, there's somebody called Sweaty Startup, uh, Nick Huber, who's a friend of mine, who's like brilliant, writes a bunch of really detailed deep dives. Um, I also like Alex Lieberman, CEO of The Morning Brew. He gives a lot of like detailed perspectives too. Um, I also follow a lot of the co copy and marketing stuff lately from like Alex Garcia and uh, Blake. I think his is like copy Blake AI or something like that. Um, because I think copywriting is really powerful. So those are like a couple that just like come to the very top of mind. Then I love like, you know, a friend of ours, Sam Parr, he does the My First Million podcast, which is awesome. I listen to that one all the time, but I'm the same as you. I mean, I am feeding my brain constantly um, information. Oh, and I really like Joe Lonsdale's American Optimist. Um, it's really good about more broad-based events of what's happening in the world and um, sort of how to uh, navigate uh, the world around us and, and maybe some good things too. Okay. I feel like those were a lot of what I call like broccoli answers, like broccoli and carrots, which is like the smarts, but what's like your candy answer? Do you oh, follow God. like the dodo, like the cute animals or like a meme account, like a meme Lord? Like what's your like, like, trashy, I'm trashy accounts that you follow? I listen to more TikTok than any 35 year old woman should. It's I mean, so the amount good. of TikTok da dance videos that I watch is, I don't even know why I watch. Like it comes up on my phone and I'm and they're just like, ding, 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 and then the music in the background, you know? And, and before you know it, I've watched 37 of like a little, you know, blonde haired chick, not really doing great dancing. So um, yeah, so I think that would probably be my, my dirty little secret. Uh, but besides that, I try, like, I really try to limit it to be fair because I have a pea brain of a squirrel brain when it comes to distraction. And so if I go down a TikTok rabbit hole, 20 minutes later, I'm like emerging, you know, like 
crap just happened. Um, and so I'm, I'm really careful with that. And then, um, which is why I try to, I will, I will read a lot of fiction too. I really like fiction, but well-written fiction, keeping it highbrow. Uh I mean, there's a reason why it's candy, right? Like that's why I have to put my popcorn in small bowls. Cause if not, if I just take the bag of popcorn, I consume the whole kettle corn bag and then that's a yeah. problem. So, yeah, you know, so. I get it. You just <laughs> limit yourself on that. Exactly. Um, okay. If you could give us all homework this week, like something that we should do, something that we should watch, something that we should read. You're the teacher, we're the students what would be your homework assignment that all of us would do this week to make ourselves better, more financially free, questioning more things, being free thinkers? Well, I think you should definitely go to contrarianthinking.co and you should sign up and read all of those, I think. Um, but after you do that, I think um, if I had to give you one, one piece of of advice to sort of take or one thing to go down a rabbit hole on, you know, I would probably do those two books that I gave you earlier. So not one, but two, I would go back because it seems like a lot of people have the same questions Four hour work week, who, not how, and think about how to optimize your life to create enough space for you to create the thing that you were supposed to do that thing that like burns inside of you. And if you can create enough space, it's really hard to, um, to not, come up with something that's going to help you cash flow and get more financially free. So I would create more space first in your life and then you can lean in to that thing you were supposed to build. I love that. Okay. If people are like subscribing to what you're putting down, what social platforms do you spend the most time on? Where can they follow you? Where can they find you? How do they, how do they keep intersecting with you? Yeah. Uh, Instagram. I'm Cody. I'm, wait, I'm just Cody Sanchez. Uh, that's my name. C O D I E. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then on Twitter, I'm Cody underscore Sanchez. I think those are probably the two where I'm most frequent. I mean, we're on TikTok too, and that platform's growing like crazy. You guys should, should all build something. Kim, you really need to have a TikTok. I know how you feel about all this stuff, but um, you need a TikTok because the algorithm's just madness for virality. But um, TikTok, I'm on, and I have little snippets if that's how you like to consume content. But I don't think that is gonna be your game changer. That's like the candy that you can listen to and then you come in for deeper things that will actually make change. So I would go to Twitter and, and Instagram. Love, oh my goodness. You have been amazing. Thank you so, so much. I know everybody had the best time learning from you and we'll go and follow you on all these platforms. So everybody, please help me and tell you, thanking Cody for your time and your knowledge. We so appreciate yeah, it. Thank you everyone. So fun, all Thanks, the questions. Guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs>